Welcome to Model Steam Engines for Beginners, Part 22. Essential information regarding locomotive to track adhesion. Getting the wheel balance right. If you think about it, a cast iron wheel, even a cast iron wheel with a steel tyre on a steel rail, was never a good idea from a grip point of view. Nowhere near as good as a rubber tyre on a road. Railway locomotives up to the present day did not evolve in the same way as cars. You may be wondering why I'm showing on screen an image of a tender upside down. Well, it's to show the springs, and every one of these springs needs to be the same. And when the tender is the right way up, the springs need to apply the same amount of pressure to each wheel. Here's a clip from a long time ago. I think I was around 35 years old. And it was at this time, when my beard was not grey, that I discovered the importance of correct suspension. This was a 5 inch gauge manor class locomotive that I rebuilt many years ago. And as you can hear, the beats are very even and the wheels are not slipping on the track. However, this was not the case when I first rebuilt it. The locomotive had working leaf springs and it really took a lot of messing about to get it to run right. Many happy hours were spent at this time adjusting the leaf springs on this locomotive. Recently I rebuilt this engine that I sold to a friend of mine once I'd finished building it and here's a test run on the bench. This engine's springing was perfect. This is a Martin Evans Simplex locomotive pretending to be a Great Western engine and in common with most locomotive designs these days it has two springs under each axle box and they are coil springs. This is my Sterling single and with a single wheel locomotive the balance is critical because if you get it wrong it really won't go anywhere, it won't even pull its own tender. It's called a single wheeler but really of course it does have two, I'm only referring to one side. But bear in mind with all these wheels it's only the centre pair that contact the track. Under each of the large pair of wheels are a pair of adjustable compression springs and on the front bogey the trailing pair of wheels and the tender wheels there is only one compression spring per wheel. Please watch the next part of this video carefully. This is what you need to know and it is very important. You need to know how much pressure each of the wheels puts on the track. First of all I'm putting a screwdriver blade underneath the front wheel on the bogey. When I rotate the screwdriver it lifts the wheel off the track. You can see it very clearly in this close-up. And it's only the front wheel that's lifting off the track, not the wheel at the other side, just the wheel that has the screwdriver underneath it. And if you look carefully at this clip, you will see that the wheel behind it isn't moving either. Or at least not until I put the screwdriver blade under that. And the same thing happens. One side of the bogey lifts, the other one doesn't, and the front wheel stays firmly on the track. This clip shows the axle box and the suspension arrangement on the tender and if you look carefully at the axle box you'll see that the edges of the flanges are chamfered. This is absolutely vital. If you don't have the chamfer on the axle boxes they can only go up and down. So when you lift one side of the wheel the whole thing becomes very solid and does not function as suspension. By chamfering the axle box it allows this to happen. Can you see how the wheel lifts and rocks slightly? It doesn't just go up and down. And this is the thing with railway engines. They are a mechanical anomaly. The same thing needs to happen on the driven wheels, which if you think about it is utterly wrong. Depending on the type of valve gear, the wheel either has external Valsharts valve gear or it could have Stevenson's link internal. Either way, the parts that connect to the axle are being moved in a way they're not designed to move. Apart from the position of the cylinders, Stevenson seemed to get it right on the Stevenson's rocket because the connecting rod arrangement was different. The big end of a modern steam locomotive just fits straight onto the crank pin, whereas with the Stevenson's rocket, the big end was a ball and socket joint, which allowed for separate up and down movement of each of the wheels. To allow for this uneven movement of the wheels on a modern locomotive, it's all down to the engineering tolerance of the crank pin and the bearings of the connecting rods and the coupling rods. To some people that may seem to be a bit odd, and yes it is, but it works. On this Sterling single, 
I'm rolling one of the large centre wheels onto the screwdriver, and this is really taking some turning. I'm having to put a lot more pressure on this to lift the wheel, which means that most of the locomotive's weight is on the centre wheel. On this locomotive, the trailing wheel is slightly different. When I put the screwdriver under it, as you can see, it's trying to lift the entire locomotive. I don't think the axle boxes on this wheel are chamfered quite as much as on the others. The main thing is when I lift this wheel, all of the other wheels remain on the track. And once again, most of the weight of the locomotive is on this centre pair of wheels. And I know this is going to work, because many years ago I built a Midland spinner, and that worked fine. Same wheel arrangement as this, two centre driving wheels, and it could pull a house down. On YouTube you get a lot of naysayers, people criticising and generally knocking whatever you try and do. But naysayers are not a new thing. When I built this Midland Spinner, quite a lot of members at the Locomotive Club, of which I was a member, were heard to say, well that's not going to pull many passengers, I bet it won't even pull you. I weighed around 22 stone in those days. But not only did the Midland Spinner pull me, it would pull a passenger truck behind me with about six people on it. And it didn't have any problem pulling on the incline. Here I'm testing the suspension on the tender, which is slightly firmer. I did this on purpose, because when the tender is full of water, it's surprisingly heavy, and I wanted to make sure that it sat at the same level as the engine. After going round the entire engine, I wanted a quick refresher to tell me how much pressure was required to lift the centre wheel. And I would just like to say that in this clip it took quite a lot of physical strength to rotate the screwdriver to lift the wheel off the track. So there you have it. That's how to make sure that a single wheeler actually pulls weight. And don't forget adjusting the springs on the individual wheels to give each wheel maximum adhesion also applies on other engines that have many more than two driving wheels. I will also be using some of the information from this video on the next episode about the Sterling Single. From my experience I would say that this is the most useful video I've probably ever made regarding successful running of miniature steam locomotives. The main enemy of any steam locomotives, be it full size or miniature, is oil on the track. And probably up to a point, snow isn't too good either. To counteract this slippery track problem, most full-size locomotives are fitted with sand boxes that drop sand onto the track just in front of the wheels. You can do this with miniature locomotives, but it's better to spread the sand on the track using a separate machine. That's it for now. Stay safe and healthy. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.